you very much for uh, for standing tall on this issue and standing by our civil liberties and for a little bit of sanity. We need more of this uh, from uh, MPs across the House in the House of Commons. We do have the bizarre situation when it comes to vaccine passports of the Prime Minister with a majority of 80 elected just two years ago uh, facing such a big rebellion. There's talk of around 50, some saying under, some saying more than 50, some even saying possibly even 100 Tory MPs, basically anyone who's not on the payroll of the government uh, considering voting against this. And the Prime Minister getting a very controversial measure through based on opposition votes. Um, why are you opposed to uh, vaccine passports? Uh, because they're completely redundant. If you can get the virus having been vaccinated already, there's absolutely no point in having a vaccination passport. Um, and I thought it was particularly interesting hearing your previous guest talking about the damage it's going to do to his industry. And you have to think about the fact that this is a massive step back without the necessary evidence to prove its worth. Um, and frankly, I'm pretty disappointed the opposition hasn't been doing anything on this. In fact, I think when it comes to COVID measures, I've voted against the government more than the opposition have. So frankly, I hope there is a massive uh, rebellion on Tuesday, which is when I think the vote is not Monday, um, because we've got to make people aware of the fact that this unnecessary piece of paper is just a ridiculous form of bureaucracy. And as Scotland's already proved, there's not a shred of evidence to show that they work. Well, I mean, and this is the thing. We know this won't work. We know that as cases uh, rise of, of Delta and Omicron in this country, as they inevitably will, because it's December and that's what will happen with the dominant virus uh, in this country at, at this time, um, that the argument won't be, oh, they've gone up anyway. So obviously the vaccine passports have caused a lot of damage and a massive infringement of people's civil liberties. Um, they have and the mask mandates and all that. They haven't worked, so we won't have them anymore. The argument will then be from all sides, it would appear, we need to have more measures. Um, as soon as I heard that press conference on Wednesday night, I knew we were at the start of the slippery slope downwards into yet another well, they might not call it lockdown. We might not all be forced to be in our homes, might not go back all the way, but we're going to be back in lockdown territory uh, yet again with no evidence that that will actually, in the long term, save lives. Listen, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It's not about case numbers now. It is about hospitalizations and death. But what really struck me as strange is that on Wednesday, you had the health secretary talking about the hospitalizations in South Africa. Well, with all due respect, I'm not bothered about the hospitalizations in South Africa. I'm bothered about the hospitalizations in the UK. I'm bothered about the level of vaccinations we have in the UK. I'm particularly interested in the level of antibodies we have in the UK, which according to the ONS is 95%. I'm not trying to be complacent about this. I'm just saying that we have to move forward. We have to live with this and we can't start going backwards on this. And, you know, when it comes to another lockdown, no chance. Um, and I think you'll see... When you say no chance, what do you mean by no chance? You know perfectly well the Labour Party would vote for it. The government min uh, ministers will vote for it. So when you say no chance, I mean, it's if the I mean, government puts it through, it's going to yeah. happen. Unfortunately, that's reality, but I can only do what I can do on the back benches and I will make my voice yeah. very clear. And OK, maybe one person, but I'm sure I'll be in good company. I've said, um, uh, listen, I, 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 I and I'm sure many of my listeners thank you for that and for speaking out and, and many of your uh, other of your colleagues, because even Theresa May, I mean, she has been speaking out saying we can't keep shutting down the economy. And a lot of people are very blasé about this. Oh, well, it's quite nice working from home. I don't have the commute. I can stay in my gym jams on my bottom half while I'm on the Zoom call. But millions of people will still have to be out at work. Of course they will. But their jobs will be under threat because their jobs are reliant on other people also being uh, out of work. You know, that's hospitality, whether it's cleaners, whether it's taxi drivers, uh, hospitality across the board being hit by this already before the work from home guidance comes into force on, on Monday. Um, do you think that people will comply? And do you think what given what we know now, what was happening inside number 10 in November and December? And does anyone really have any doubt that there were these parties, that there were breaches of the rules? Do you think there is any moral duty? for people to comply with any of these new rules? I mean, I think there's always a moral duty for people to follow the rules of the land, but I also have to question whether or not people will listen to it. And I think when your authority to be able to pass those rules is um, called into question, it makes it even more difficult to get people to adhere to them. I don't know what happened in number 10 last year over three parties. I'm the last person on anyone's list to invite to a party <laughs> in number 10. So, um, I have no idea. I do want to see the investigation. I do. I am deeply concerned that someone like Nor Guide's reputation is being questioned. He has got an impeachable, unimpeachable record. Um, and I think that's a very, very serious thing. And the message I've been sending out to my constituents is that you have to you have to see the outcome of that investigation and action has to be taken if it's proved, well, if it proves wrongdoing.
Well, that's it. We, I just wanted to ask you about that. After the Electoral Commission fined the Conservative Party almost £18,000 uh, over basically failure to cro- properly register this donation from Lord Brownlow for the refurbishment uh, of, the, of the number 11 Downing Street flat that Carrie and Boris Johnson live in. Um, but it does, the, their evidence contradicts the evidence that was given by Boris Johnson in, to Lord Guy. His own appoint, he personally appointed Lord Guy as his standards advisor, um, where he basically said he didn't know where the money was coming from. This is in February earlier this year, whereas uh, a WhatsApp message seen by the Electoral Commission uh, from Boris Johnson uh, to, was asking about the donations uh, as way back as September 2020. Um, clearly, those two those two claims can't be reconciled. And Lord Guy is considering resigning if there cannot be a reasonable explanation for this. If I mean, if Lord Guy resigns, if we have established that the Prime Minister has lied to his own advisor and we don't know 100% for sure then but it certainly looks that way is it tenable for him to continue in number 10? Uh, I mean listen I came into politics because I think you have to stand up and do the right thing but you also have to be honest and uh, honest and transparent and show leadership and that is uh, that's why I'm in it um, if he if he lied then it's not down to me as whether or not his position is tenable it's down to the conservative party and the party members um and he has to answer for that and i think you know the one thing i've always said is the conservative party is brutal um when it needs to get rid of a leader it does it and um frankly you know people are feeling very unhappy that's not me saying that i want to see the prime minister go it's certainly not but i'm just saying you know the party needs to have faith that people are telling the truth doing the job and not moving the goalposts as we are over covid yeah, and the just, measures that we're trying to put in. Just, just finally, the Sajid Javid, the health secretary, has said that we are looking at a situation where it is uh, uh, the incredible risk that the NHS could be overwhelmed this winter. Would that, if that were the case, uh, we have got no evidence for that right now, would that justify for you bringing in mandatory vaccines, as as the Prime Minister has even uh, uh, talked about at press conference this week, uh, and uh, any other lockdown measures? No. I mean, it, to be to be to be perfectly blunt, uh, are we are we going into uh, new restrictive measures because we're worried about the increase of the vaccine uh, increase of the virus, or are we worried because of the risk of the NHS? If it's the risk on the NHS, then it's time to double down, bring in the military, bring in reopen Nightingale hospitals, provide the extra service, but not go back on this. You know, we're throwing more money into the NHS than ever before, and we're not asking for the changes. We're not asking for the increases in beds that we should be expecting, and it's it's striking that so many of the Nightingale hospitals aren't still open. I mean, I think Exeter down in the southwest has actually purchased theirs to do overflow. We need to be thinking like that. It's ridiculous that we're also doing it at the same time without producing data showing an increase in hospitalisation, as you made that point this week. Uh, Anthony Magnell, thank you so much for joining us. A really strong voice on this. Uh, Good for you for speaking out and talking sense and sanity. And thank you for your vote on Monday when it comes. Conservative MP for Totnes and South Devon.